Every year, more than 10 million visitors are attracted by the stunning orange color and breathtaking design. Its majestic towers piercing the San Francisco sky, spanning 4,200 feet across the Golden Gate Strait, a world record at the time, one of the most iconic landmarks in the world. However, before construction began, most thought it would be impossible to build in the first place, and it almost got painted yellow and black. Stay tuned as today we're heading to the west coast, a few miles away from the once infamous Alcatraz prison to discover the fascinating story of the Golden Gate Bridge. San Francisco in the late 19th century was a thriving and growing city. A major concern at the time was the connection between the city of San Francisco and what is now Marin County. Up until this point in history, the only practical way across the Golden Gate Strait was by ferry. The ride took approximately 20 minutes and cost a grand total of $1 per vehicle. For ferry companies, business was booming. Some 2.5 million cars crossed the strait each year. So, as you can imagine, ferry operators weren't too keen on a bridge taking all their customers. You see, the idea to build a bridge over the river Cog. Anyway, the idea to build a bridge in the strait wasn't a new idea. But most engineers and architects thought such a feat would be impossible. Intense winds reaching 96 km an hour, strong tides, thick fog blanket, and the earthquake-prone San Andreas Fault resulted in heavy opposition from the engineering community. More opposition came from the military concerned about the bridge becoming a potential target, ferry companies saw it as fierce competition, and residents wanted to preserve the natural scenery of the coast. The engineers, however, were determined to build it. Joseph Strauss, a man whose name has become synonymous with the bridge, came up with a cantilever design, consisting of a single beam supported at one end. I won't be going into much detail about the structural engineering of the bridges themselves, that will be covered in another video. Strauss's design consisted of two cantilevers connected in the middle by a span structure. His colleagues, however, Charles Ellis, Irving Morrow, and Leo Moisef tackled the problem with a different approach that city officials and other stakeholders approved of. The suspension bridge, which uses cables to suspend the deck across the distance between the two towers. This design allows the bridge to move with wind and load fluctuations, reducing stresses on the metal structure. This is known as deflection theory, by which a thin, flexible roadway would flex in the wind and stresses would be absorbed by the suspension cables. An interesting fact is that Ellis designed a second bridge on the south side to avoid demolishing Fort Point, a pre-Civil War fortification. Construction began on January 5th, 1933, costing approximately 35 million US dollars, 610 million in today's currency. Steel components at these massive sizes could only be built at steelworks on the east coast, which meant that steel needed to be transported across the entire North American continent. The recently inaugurated Panama Canal made this a bit easier to do. Building the two towers was the first step in the construction process of the bridge. The North Tower was relatively simple because of the shallow seabed, but when it came to the South Tower, things weren't that straightforward. You see, to connect the tower to the seabed, a 10-story foundation had to be built. Because of the immense depth of the strait, they couldn't simply dig out the foundation. Bombs were dropped on the seafloor, creating a massive hole to pour concrete and direct a solid foundation for the tower. A huge oval-shaped concrete barrier was then constructed to protect the base of the south tower from ship collisions during fog. Tides were a big headache during the bridge's construction, leading workers to work in 20-minute shifts in between tides. Safety was a major concern for the chief engineer, Joseph Strauss. Movable nets were put in place around the towers to prevent anyone from falling into the ocean below, saving a good number of lives. Some fatalities, though, were 
sadly unavoidable. In February 1937, an entire scaffolding around one of the towers collapsed, dragging with it 12 workers, only two of which survived the 200 foot fall into the sea. With the two towers complete, suspension wires and suspenders were installed in place which allowed the concrete passageway to be constructed. The final task was to paint the bridge. Interestingly, the military were pushing heavily for a black and yellow color combination, but through opposition raised by the architects, engineers and the public, the bridge was painted with the iconic international orange color we know and love today. Now head over to the French capital to learn about the incredible story of the Eiffel Tower. Thank you very much for watching guys and I'll see you all in the next one.